Hey everybody, good afternoon. Um, so this is about building a security operations center. We're going to show a little video first of what they tend or people think they look like. Um, pretty awesome video. Well, not really that awesome, but here you go. We've detected an anomaly. How bad is it? Traffic's off the chart. They're pinging more targets. Isolate. Prevent damage. Got them. Great exercise, guys. Let's run it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if only we had <laughs> those kind of screens. Okay, we don't work for them. <laughs> no, um, we don't. <laughs> so I want to apologize to any Lockheed Martin employees right off the bat too. Um, most security operations centers do not look like that, uh, but everybody wants them to. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, what makes a security operations center? Uh, well, it's a lot of things. A lot of people think it's just an IDS system or just a firewall, and we'll get to that. But. Um, the general flow is it starts with uh, events, things that happen on the network um, or in the environment and often that gets the network environments, network things go through the IDS system. Um, there's a management system that manages that traffic, there's analyst systems, there are uh, analysts who analyze that stuff, contextual info like log data, uh, time of event, all sorts of things. Uh, reporting that thing and then incident response, just dealing with the uh, hack attempts or the malware or whatever. So what's the point though of a SOC? Uh, Chris, do you want to say something? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> a security operations center is designed to give you real-time detection and response. Okay, it's a central coordination point. So if you can detect everything happening on your network, whether your network is three or four machines or whether your network is 3,000 machines spread over a wide area. Um, a security operations center, as opposed to a CERT, which does a lot of incident tracking and reporting and putting out uh, reports about recommendations for how to configure things and whatnot, a SOC is operational. The key there is that it's real time, real response. Okay, so it's not just a offline log review; it's real time. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, keep everything running. You know, just. <laughs> keep it going smoothly. Uh, so it, isn't a firewall IDS or just antivirus enough? Um, well, firewall, it's, it's useful obviously. It's, um, people know about it. Attackers know about it. it. It only protects your systems. It doesn't protect your users. Um, an antivirus it has this lag time to catch new threats and uh, it's not going to catch anything brand new. Um, and it matches files, you know, not traffic patterns, not the flow of the network data. Um, the uh, IDS itself alerts on events. It's a lot like uh, antivirus software where it depends on rules to be written for it, things that have been discovered or that you might be watching for. Um, it doesn't provide context, doesn't give you system logs, proxy logs, DNS logs, or information from users or other people. So these are the three components that every organization thinks they need to have. Uh, back in the, like the 80s, everybody had to have a firewall. That was the new thing. Everyone needed one. So as the 90s approached, everybody got a firewall. Now we're safe. And then antivirus started popping up and malware was important. So then everybody started investing in malicious code defense. Uh, now everyone has to run an intrusion detection system. There are a lot of vendors out there that do that. Vendors cost money. Uh, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. So what we want to do is we want to go with these items free, cheap, low, no cost, uh -huh. but we also need to fill in the other gaps. Firewall, AV, and an intrusion detection system is not a security operations center. It's a start. It's a good core set of components, but it's not everything you need. Mm -hmm. So what's the structure of a SOC? Uh, there's a lot, a lot you can put in the SOC. Um, you've got private network and you've got people. You also have a ma uh, your main network that you're watching and the environment you're watching. Um, I'll brief over these because we go over these individually. The private network has the IDS, management systems, analyst systems, and hopefully a lab. Uh, you've got your people, which are the analysts, other experts. You've got users and management. And all this is happening real, in real time, 24-7. Uh, you've got to keep watching everything that's happening. 
I don't know if you want to say anything about that. <laughs> Do I want to say anything about that? Um, <laughs> what you need is a balance between technology and meat space. Uh, the computers, no matter how good your technology is, and no matter how much automation people are putting in, you're still going to need people to look at your logs. You're still going to pe need people to analyze the anomalies, to figure out what's really going on. Uh, most of the systems that we already talked about, the firewalls and IDS as an AV attack, or try to defend against known threats. Okay? That there's going to be a group of stuff that you know is good on your network, whether you're using anomaly based or not. A group of stuff that you know is good, and a group of stuff that you suspect is bad. But in the middle of that is going to be a whole big group of, I don't know, someone has to look at that. So that's what the analysts are for. That's what the people are for. So the, talking about the private network, <clears throat> uh, you want to have a secure communication uh, network between your IDS management system, analyst systems. Um, you don't want it to be accessible to anyone trying to attack it. Attack it. You want it to be, uh, you want to keep malware off the systems. Um, and you want to be able to do, provide management and update of the IDS and the rules. So I have some diagrams of simple, uh, simple network diagrams of things you could do. So this one here, I don't have a laser pointer, <laughs> but you can just. <laughs> this is really simple. So you've got this network. You've got a switch. Um, it's probably not managed in this case. Um, you've got a hub, unfortunately, <laughs> going before the router, and um, you've got the the IDS system watching all traffic that comes from that switch and hopefully your server there is providing your DHCP and stuff, not your router, um, so you can see everything that's going on. This could be a basic diagram for somebody's home network if they were an enthusiast and they wanted to start learning about this stuff on their own systems. Or if you have, you know, if you have a family and you have kids or what have you, if you have a number of different computers there or in a small office environment, um, not all uh, security operation centers, just in, the idea is that every organization should have one but they don't always start that way. So sometimes it starts as a little project in a little office with some people that care and know how to do it. Okay, so this would replicate that type of environment where you just want to look at everything you've got just starting out. And so this, is, this one is a more complex one. This would be for maybe a small organization that has a managed switch uh, where you can uh, span, uh, mirror the ports to one. So it's kind of the same idea as the last one um, except you got rid of that hub. You've got the network going, uh, going through that, it's basically the same thing. It's just like here, well, you probably get it. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Um, this next one is a more complex one where you might have a DMZ. So you've got, your DMZ is a, a you've got to have your external IDS system. It's a separate from another system that has your internal LAN segments. And um, this could be scaled up uh, to worldwide systems. The key is that all the information from all of the IDSs, which if you're not in a network or an environment where you can monitor all of your traffic from either a hub or a spanned port switch, if your switches don't support that because they don't all do that, or if you're in a just such a huge environment that you need multiple taps. What? <laughs> if you're in a network where you have multiple taps, the key is to get all the data as securely as you can back to your management systems, to your analyst stations so that you can start looking at it. Yeah. And you can, have, you can have any number of IDS systems. They can all send data to one management system or multiple management, which would be kind of a nightmare. Um, and you can have multiple analyst systems um, all accessing that management system. You could additionally, we'll get to this too, but you could additionally have everything running on one box. You could have management, analyst, uh, IDS. So talking about the actual IDS systems themselves, you're going to want to have a secured OS. Um, Linux is probably the best to do. Um, for this. Uh, they have things, the software like Snort, they have it on um, Windows, but I, I wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, so you want to learn how to secure the, secure the OS. There are a lot of guidelines. NSA has some good guidelines on securing uh, all the different operating systems that you can find online. Um, the software, there's Snort, which is a really popular open source software created by Sourcefire. They have a um, a version that you can pay for, which offers more. But Snort is fantastic. There's also a new one called Suricata. I might be pronouncing that wrong, but um, I believe I might be wrong about this. But I think some people from Sourcefire went off and started that. It's a it's a great another great IDS software, um, and it's it's used it uses rules um, that you can write or are also maintained by a community and by Sourcefire to uh, watch for network anomalies. 
you've got um, there's a software called Barnyard 2 which will take the data from Snort and send it off to your MySQL database or Oracle database or whatever. You've got um, there's a thing called Pulled Pork which replaces something that that was called Oink Master. It uh, will manage your rules so if you have custom rules it will actually keep them intact instead of overriding them every single time. And you've got S Tunnel which will uh, securely transfer all that data from Barnyard 2 um, that comes from Snort, secure it over any network segment of any kind to your database server, which is um, possibly your management station. And then you also have um, packet capture. You've got to have constant running packet capture so you can review packets um, or network transactions as you see things happening. And uh, TCP dump can be set to write as a, uh, run as a daemon and can save files of any size or certain time lengths. There's also a program called Daemon Logger that is, uh, looks pretty great. It actually can run as a software tap. So um, I'll get to taps later. But uh, it will write out PCAP files or dump files and also run as a software tap on a really inexpensive system. So there's a tendency, whether you're in a corporate environment, whether you're working with government or whether you're doing this on your own, to over engineer any facet of your security infrastructure. Okay, when we're talking about a secured OS, uh, as Josh mentioned, Linux is the best choice for that. It's the most flexible. There are a lot of distros already set up. There are a lot of pre-built things that will run this very securely, very safely. You can bump up to OpenBSD if you really need something secure. You can write a custom OS. There's a lot of different things that you can do for this. Um, the IDS software, we mentioned Snort and all the supporting tools for that. Snort has been around a very long time. Props to those guys. Those guys are awesome. Um, there are a lot of commercial IDSs that are based very heavily on what Snort has done. If you want to spend money, you can spend money and buy something like that or you can use Snort or something very similar and you can, you can roll your own. You can do a lot of very good things custom to your environment with Snort that you can't do with other things or that vendors will not do for you. Okay, so this isn't just where we look for open source stuff and that's all we're going to talk about. There are some distinct advantages to this. And the one final point on this is when we're talking about the packet capture, if you're in a large environment, packet capture is a huge problem simply because of size. You cannot capture all of the packets going across your network and all of the data all the time and then be able to look at it. So you may have to build custom rules as to what you want to capture and let them have triggers or targets as far as you really want to see everything to certain groups, certain servers, and then understand that there, if you're in a more complex environment, there are some systems that you just don't really want to see all that important information for. Yeah. And you know, there are a lot of, uh, as you're saying, there are a lot of uh, pre-built distros. There's some live CDs out there. I don't know if I put them in the slides, but um, there's something called Easy IDS, which is fantastic. Uses Snort. Uses some management software. It can run off the CD. There's other ones too. Some really great stuff out there. Uh, so this is what Snort looks like. I mean, kind of. It's part of it as it's running. You see the little piggy there, though. That's the cutest part over on the left bottom. And uh, it's snorting up all those packets. So the management system itself you also want a secured OS for this thing. Um, and all, all this stuff is still on your, it's on your private network. Um, with, it depends on what kind of uh, management software you're using, but what I'm going to show a little bit of is uh, using LAMP, using Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Um, you have management software. That's the stuff I was just mentioning. You've got base, which is a uh, popular, kind of old, kind of dated, um, but it's still good. It's, it's a, uh, looks like, I don't know, from the web from the 90s or something, but it's fine. Um, you've got S GUI, which is Snort GUI. It's actually pretty awesome. Um, it will display real-time events popping up. Um, it was a bit of a pain to configure, so I don't have that for you, but sorry. Snorby, same thing. It's actually a web 2.0 version of base. I mean, if the person who made Snorby heard me say that, they may, they may not like it, but um, it's pretty nice. And uh, there's other stuff to grab logs like Splunk, uh, OSIM, there's Nagios to keep watch over your servers or um, report any kind of, you know, anything you want. Again, all good options. Um, the key components here as far as the management system is this is just your overhead system. This is what your uh, keeping track of your IDS is keeping track of your security infrastructure. We want to emphasize again these should be on secured OSs. This should be on a private network if possible. Um, nothing is more embarrassing than having your security infrastructure hacked for an organization. Uh, we, we've seen it and, it and it's bad. So this is what base looks like. Um, uh, you kind of have to, it refreshes, you can change the refresh rate, but it's not very exciting. Um, 
Well, I'll show you a little bit more based in a little while. Uh, the analyst systems also secured OS. Hopefully you do them on virtual machines uh, because we've seen them get um, get you know popped by malware or something. Just it happens. You know you look at malware, so sometimes it just infects your system. Um, so you want to be able to replace those really quickly, and you want to be able to change them really easily. Uh, you want to have. Um, hmm. I'll skip that part. You have analysis tools uh, such as Wireshark. TCP dump and NetWitness, which is a really great program, but it only works on Windows. It doesn't work with Wine, so it's fantastic except for that. Yeah, it's terrible. It's really sad. And there's a lot of other tools. There's a tool called Chaos Reader, which unfortunately I don't think has been updated since 2003, but uh, it's a really great program. I'll give a little demo of that briefly or after after a few more slides. Um, so you know, this is what you're doing on the analyst system. You're looking at traffic. Uh, the most common way is this Wireshark because it's easy. You can, your analysts don't have to look through a bunch of text, but sometimes text is a lot better, like in the command line on TCP dump or T Shark, um, which is the uh, command line version of Wireshark. So, depending on the size of your organization and what you're looking at, the analyst systems, like we saw in that, uh, that cool video at the beginning, um, they're looking at just a real time display of what's going on. So, their, their analysis system is a very basic system. It's got a heads up display showing a graphical representation of what's happening on the network. And it, they have a very basic ability, probably, to look at packet captures. Um, but when it comes to malware analysis, or if you really want to look at some targeted system logs or things of that nature, typically you're going to end up going to another system. Uh, the system that interfaces directly with your management interface, you really don't want to expose to malware because you don't want that malware exposed to your management interface. You don't want the malware to go from here I'm looking at it to now it's on my IDS to now it's all over my network. Okay? And then there will be very limited ways to get rid of that type of information. Um, also, typically, a lot of the security analysts or the people using the analyst workstations will be running with reduced privileges, again, to try to minimize the effect of uh, malware being able to take advantage of the systems or really intelligent hackers jumping in and being aware to target those systems directly. Yeah, and you want to make sure that they have, uh, I mean, analyst systems shouldn't have internet access. Uh, it should be limited. If you have to do research, you have another system on a separate network entirely. And you don't uh, pass things back and forth between the two systems. So you want, it'd be great to have a lab. Uh, uh, you can use it as a test system that you can test rules for the IDS so you don't run it in production. A lot of places we've seen actually do run things in production. They test things and it messes things up. Um, you can test configuration changes. You can be used as a backup in case the actual system fails, um, which could be pretty handy. Uh, it's also a safe environment, you know, to play with malware, try hacks. You can try to trigger that rule you just wrote for the IDS and make it happen. See if you can actually get into your secured private network. Um, so. your, your lab system is critical to the success of an operation center. Um, you don't want to be making configuration changes on the systems that are actively watching your network. Okay. You also don't want to be testing malware or playing with packet capture dumps and you know, downloading things off the internet to see what these scripts are doing to your network uh, and doing that anywhere on your network that's connected. Okay. This is a great place to do training if you have a large staff, which that costs money, but you've got to train somehow. Um, it's a great place to practice, but what, again, you don't want to do is ever connect your lab systems to your production environment. Ever. Please. Ever. <laughs> Uh, I think you made this slide. Did I do that? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, you need analysts. You need people. You, you have, there's, there's a huge group of people involved in running a security operations center. It starts with the users. If you didn't have users, of course, we all hate the users because they're the ones causing the problems, right? But if we didn't have them, we wouldn't need the network. So we need the users. Um, we need the sysadmins. We need security zealots to go figure out what's going on, people to go surf the web, people to come here to DEF CON, people to pay attention. Okay? We have to have the analysts sitting there 24-7, so they can't all be at DEF CON. Somebody has to stay home and watch the network. Right? Uh, management has to do whatever it is management does. Um, and you need the leadership guys. You need the guys with the checkbooks. Um, because there will be times that you'll want to spend some money. Now again, we don't want to build the big blue system that we saw at the beginning on that commercial with yeah. all the, no the nice screens. You don't need it. We'd all love to have it. That's a management's job. <laughs> yeah. We'd all love to have it, but we don't need it. Okay? But what we do need to do is sometimes we have to buy special taps. Sometimes we'll have to reroute some of the network hardware. Sometimes we'll have to buy uh, a security zealot. 
Um, if you don't have anybody on your staff, if you guys are really interested in wanting to do this, but you don't have that guy to help you guide that, you have to go find one. Sometimes those people cost money, okay? Um, so the key is you need to get everybody involved, though. Everybody has to understand what a security operations center does and what it, what it means, okay? So the users need to understand that they're being watched, not so that they know they're being watched, but so they know what they're being watched for, okay? So that they can try to stay away from malware, so that they can try to do things that uh, don't compromise the network. Uh, and then, of course, all the other folks need to be aware. Everybody has to buy into this. All right, so going to the specifics of these people, you've got the analysts. Uh, you need to have people who, they want to learn, they want to, they, they know what they're doing, they know networking, they can understand some of the things they're looking at. Um, and hopefully they've done some attacks themselves. Maybe they have their own home networks that they've built. Or if you're the analyst, I mean, you probably have your own home network that you build for downloading malware, attacking things, doing cross-site scripting or SQL injection or whatever you feel like is your thing. Um, you want people who are comfortable with source code maybe, with JavaScript unfortunately, with uh, hex, uh, open to new ideas, not stubborn, not stuck in their ways, as things keep changing. Uh, you also don't want them to blink, they should never call in sick, and they shouldn't need sleep, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but that's basically the way, that's the people we are, so. Um, <laughs> Uh, they're pretty good at deductive reasoning and critical thinking. That's pretty important. You need to be able to uh, make up for the lack of context because there's often a huge lack of context with what you're looking at. You want to say something? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can never have enough good analysts ever. Um, most security operations centers, they're 24 7, depending on the size of your network. Okay? Some of them have to start small. Some of them have to start very modest. It could be the one person who's watching an IDS because he saw it on a live CD and he put it up in his network just to see what's going on in his, in his area. Okay? But you have to build to these things. Um, you eventually may want to hire to these things or try to recruit to these things. But this is the core of what a security operations center is. In that first video where we saw all that cool technology, if none of those people sitting in that room had this skill set, it wouldn't matter what that technology was because none of them would know how to use it, okay? And the people that we saw on the previous slide, from leadership all the way through the users, if they don't believe in what's going on there, it doesn't matter what all that technology is. You can spend all the money you want. Money will not buy you security, okay? These are the folks that are the core of the operation right here, okay? They're the ones that will help get the information out to the users. They're the ones that will help get the information up to leadership. Uh, you've got other experts as well. You've got um, you know, the network administrators. They keep the whole thing going on. Uh, they can tune the IDS rules. They can update the rules, um, keep the systems up to date. You've got forensics experts which would maybe take that malware that you see on your systems um, and go look at it and see what it's doing, see what kind of data might have been leaked if any was. Um, you have incident response. You've got to have people to deal with the incidents to go see that user and um, remove that software or go re like restore that server from a backup, uh, et cetera. You've got external entities. In case of criminal action, you have to have law enforcement. You might have government involved. There's, uh, it could be if uh, personal data is leaked of your customers, you might need to involve them. Depending on the size of your network and the nature of your business, you may have some of these folks on your staff in your security operations center. You may have sysadmins there so that when you are detecting uh, attacks, you may be the one responding out to that user system to rebuild it and to tell them to stop, sur stop surfing YouTube that day or whatever. Um, the forensics guys could be part of your staff, or they may not be. You may have to reach out to consulting teams like <laughs> Mandiant. Um, incident response, same thing. You may not have the capability of going out after the fact and responding to these and cleaning these up. But there are resources out there. So the information is available. There are a lot of books here that we've seen. There's a lot of information online about basic forensics and, and things of that nature. If you're starting out small and you're starting out as a project, if this is not an official organizational effort, you can play with it. You can try it. There's a lot of information out there that can guide you for free. Um, but at some point, you may want to bump all the way down this list, and you may have to get people involved if you think criminal activity has taken place. Uh, you're not going to have the FBI on your staff. So you're going to need to know how to reach out to those folks. So look for other organizations out there that make, uh, do this for a living like CERT and try to figure out ways to get information from them on how to take your information that you're finding and bring it to them. And you've got the users, of course. They uh, report things. They report phishing emails, stolen property, loss of data. Um, they might do things. 
I'm pretty sure. <laughs> They'll probably download malware, spyware, all that good stuff. They'll engage in inappropriate activities for your organization. Um, you need to be able to watch for that. Um, and the best thing is that they're the most widely deployed IDS if you tune them properly. If you teach them and let, train them, they can watch out for your network and um, it can be a, a great resource. The, the key is um, if users aren't telling you that they're receiving phishing emails, you're not necessarily going to know if any of your users are being targeted. Um, a lot of users, uh, a good example would be my mother, unfortunately, um, who thinks she's not important enough for any hacker to want to target her system, um, but she was a spam relay for quite a long time. Uh, it's not her, and it's not her information, it's her computer, it's her internet connection. Uh, whether it's her home system or whether it's her work system, okay? And if nobody else is watching out for that, and if your organization, your security operations center, doesn't, isn't able to reach out to the mail logs to find out what's going on, then this is the kind of information where your users need to be able to give that to you. Your users can be a free intrusion detection system, okay? But they do need to be tuned properly, exactly right. They have to be trained. They have to know what to look for, okay? And as the security operations center folks, that would be our job to go teach them. We have to put it in a way that's easily digestible to them. They've got management. Uh, they interface with other entities, keep all the pieces from falling apart, they make it rain, and uh, that's the money joke. Uh, <laughs> and someone has to make decisions, so. Uh, I love management. Yeah, love them. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so then you've got, the, you've got the data. What is all the stuff you're looking at? What, what is a security operations center seeing? You got phone calls, emails, users, people talking to you, um, maybe even letters. Someone threatens someone. Um, uh, you've got log files from firewalls, hosts, proxy servers, DNS servers, uh, webmail, uh, I mean web servers, sorry, uh, and network events. And these are the things that you just kind of churn through and you, you look at it and see what's going on. The focus of a security operations center traditionally, especially in this type of a forum, is network events. It's network logs, it's network analysis. Um, but here we are at DEF CON and we've got lock picking stuff going on and we've got social engineering stuff going on. There is a number of other uh, disciplines of security that are involved in this. And while you're not necessarily going to be your security staff, if you work in an organization that has you know, security rent the cops hanging around and you know, watching people and you need badges and all that, your security operations center isn't necessarily going to know if somebody tried to get into a machine room. You need to get involved in that information and get those logs from those entities. Okay, you need to integrate that into what you're doing. If, if four times in one week some folks are trying to get into the server room as a physical security measure, you may want to know that as a network operation center. Okay? So handling all that data is a big, big deal. Um, you have to be able to filter that data and get out the false positives and threshold the uh, constant constant attacks, the things that are all the same that keep on happening, and you want to categorize that data. Um, and categorization can uh, go all sorts of ways. You have the thing that freaks you out and you see, you see an attack on your system, you've got something you've got to deal with and um, something that maybe you want to research more. Depending on the size of your network, the amount of hits, the amount of people scanning your network could be horrendous. Uh, or if your network is sufficiently small enough, you may have absolute control over your perimeter and what's going by. Um, there are internet resources that can tell you if there's a spike in secure shell scanning going on because of some recent activity. That can help you find out what's going on, so you need to be able to reach out to those resources. But without having all that information, without doing any of that filtering, all that stuff is showing up in your logs. You need to spend cycles looking at it, siphoning that down to figure out what's going on. If you know you're not running secure shell, do you care about secure shell scanning? Chances are you may not from an actionable point of view, but you may want to from a realistic point of view from an awareness perspective. Okay. So you need to be able to get all this information down, take the entirety of everything you're looking at and figure out for your environment what's best and, and pare it down into things that you can prioritize and take action on. So uh, CERT actually has some great uh, categorization recommendations. Uh, they have seven categories um, that you can filter th things through which will make things looking at, look at things, make it easier to look through things that are coming through your network. Um, instead of one screen full of everything. Uh, you've got cat one for su uh, successful unauthorized access. That's when someone actually gets in and accomplishes what they were setting out to accomplish. You have category two for denial of service. Category three, you have uh, installation of malware or maybe in fact uh, a beaconing of malware. Um, four would be improper usage. You could put spyware in there or you could, because you know, users download it. You could also put browsing porn 
um, if that's not what your organization's into. Uh, <laughs> And uh, category five would be scans or attempted access. So you might have someone trying to uh, do a SQL injection and they were unsuccessful. Maybe that's a category five and it's not a category one because they didn't actually make it. And category six, investigation. Everything that doesn't fit. Uh, you don't know what's happening. You need to check it out more. These, these categories are roughly based on NIST guidance that came out before. Um, most of the larger certs that have evolved over the past decade or so have come up with different variations of this. This is U.S. certs take on what NIST came up with. Um, and again, the larger organizations um, like DOD cert or, or any other um, federal level certs or even other nation certs, they kind of all have modifications of this. The key is this is just a way to respond to things. Okay? So you want to understand what's important in your environment. And this is roughly based on the attacker's goals and what level of impact they were able to have on your network. So being able to get access to your systems or your data or your users. Whether the user responded to a phishing email and sent their username and password back to these guys. That would be unauthorized access. Even though they haven't taken advantage of it yet, that username and password is exposed. Okay? Uh, denial of service, typically what these guys want is only if it's successful denial of service. Only if it actually happened. Do these guys care? So as far as whatever U.S. cert is, has purview over, they only care if it's actually happened. They, it worked. Um, installation of malware or post-infection beaconing, uh, intrusion, uh, uh, inclusion rather into a botnet, anything of, the, of those nature, that, that's category three. They only care if it actually worked. If your antivirus caught it, they don't want to know and they don't care within the purview of, of what they're reporting. Um, your management will dictate generally what you're going to want to report and how you're going to take action on it. Your leadership will build that type of information system, those types of uh, processes in. They'll finance you for those processes, I guess. But what's important here is understanding that uh, it, it's up to your environment. So if you're starting this out, low, no cost, free, whatever, you need to use this as a way to justify what you're doing so that you can possibly get more money from management and leadership, to show impact, to show that you're actually catching things, to make it actionable. Okay? If you can show that it's actionable and you can show that other organizations think this is important, you can use this publicly available guidance and you can say, look, the U.S. CERT thinks this is important, maybe we should too. So uh, getting into the analysis of stuff, uh, you've got, I didn't do a little demo for this, but um, if you want to <laughs> analyze something such as malware, um, you might you see an alert pop up on your analyst system. Uh, I don't know malware check in. Who knows? Uh, you want to look at the network capture and see what's really happening. Maybe take a look at the user agent. Look at all these different things to provide information on what's happening. And you might have to research what that traffic means. What um, you might have to look up the uh, external IP it's beaconing out to, or maybe what someone downloaded from. And then you, if you can, you want to have firewall log access, look at firewall log. You want maybe proxy log that will help uh, determine what's happening. You want to look at the AV log on the system itself. Um, hopefully uh, it caught it. Or if it's beaconing out, it probably didn't catch it. And you want to see the system log, see what maybe has been changed. Uh, maybe there would be something that could help you in there. All that stuff is context. It provides context to the uh, IDS alert that originated the thing. Um, and you want to talk to the user, find out what happened. Did they click on an email? Did they download something they thought it was a great game or something like that? Um, and then you do incident response dealing with that malware. Yeah. Yeah, this process is important. This process is essentially money in the bank. If you have access to these types of data sources and you can follow through this process in an efficient manner, if it doesn't take you months to get this type of information, Okay, if you can get this information within an hour or two of an IDS alert, you can find out what happened and probably mitigate it before it does a lot of damage to your network. Um, there was a great talk. Ooh, sorry. There was a great talk yesterday, actually. Um, it was a, some folks that were profiling malware and how folks were getting infected. Uh, most of it was user driven and it was based off social engineering sites and whatever was trendy and going on at the time. Uh, those were the guys that had the Playmate of the Year come in. Did anybody else see that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so the guys, again, in that sock that we saw at the beginning, they were looking at their real-time IDS alerts. They may have access to packet capture, but they're probably not the firewall administrators. Any network they can afford a security operations center that looks like that, their firewall administrators are working somewhere else, okay, in a little server closet somewhere. Okay, so you need to get those firewall logs, though, because if you get popped with malware, chances are you might go out and try to download more malware. There are a number of Trojans out there that will do that. Okay? So you want to know if your firewall is blocking those connections. Okay, though if their firewall is dropping them, they may not, depending on where your stuff is placed on your network, that may not trigger on your intrusion detection system. 
Because if your firewall is dropping it before it gets out to your IDS, you're not going to get an alert. Okay? The proxy log, where was the user before they got the malware? That's where the malware probably came from. Either it was a, you know, a compromised ad that was you know, redirecting them to some hidden iframe and this, that, and the other. There are so many clever ways to get this stuff in now that it's, it's really kind of a, a game to find out where this stuff came from. And getting good at that game makes you really good at doing this. Uh, looking at your antivirus log, again, if your antivirus flags on it, sometimes, because the antivirus has a lag, it won't flag when the malware is downloaded to the user's system. It only flags after it runs, in some cases. Okay? And when that happens, the malware can still be running in memory and beaconing, even though AV has quarantined the results of the files after they've run. So what happens is you'll end up with a system that's already beaconing, and some AV guy will go look at the log and say, no, Symantec quarantined it, or McAfee quarantined it, and it's done. But the system is still beaconing because it's running in memory. And until the system's rebooted, it's going to continue doing that. So a security operations center, again, being able to have that real-time view of what's going on and have access to all these logs can tell you that that system is still compromised. And while it's still compromised and beaconing, it can continue causing further damage. Uh, looking at your other system logs and all that information, but the big money, talking to the user, especially in malware. Find out what they were doing and what they saw. If you find out what they saw when it was happening, that's again a human intrusion detection system signature. You get that information out to your other users. Hey, this is what they saw when they were infected. And that again helps tune your other ideas. Yeah, it will, it will provide the education your users need. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. So, all right. <laughs> so actually, I have a little video of just a, a, a grab of a file and then a um, reviewing the data. Uh, it basically following that same procedure we saw for the malware. But I'll just go ahead and show this. And it's a little bit odd the way it goes, but here you go. So we've got, I'm running, uh, I just ran TCP dump uh, manually, but it would be running as a daemon process probably. Um, I'm showing you here on base, uh, there's nothing in there right now. Um, so I've got TCP dump running, watching the network traffic, and I've got this uh, system, this, that TCP dump is running on a virtual machine, this is on a separate machine. So this is a uh, damn vulnerable Linux. Um, they're getting the et cetera password file with a command execution, so they, they get that file on that Linux system. And uh, now we're going to go back over to base and you'll see as we refresh it that um, there's an alert. Uh, it said our password attempt. I tried to get this thing. So you, you don't know if they got it yet. You just want to see. So you go in here in the base and it's a little bit odd but um, you can see oh they, they posted something from their website or from this website and they, this is what they posted, google.com and there's some uh, encoding in there, then cat, et cetera, password. Um, so now you need to look at the PCAP. So I actually opened it up. I took it from the dump I was doing. So there's that post right there. Um, and then you want to uh, take a look at the data. There's actually, you can follow the stream with Wireshark, which is a little easier, but I had some trouble with that for some reason. But here it is. You can see the, uh, they, they got that. They got the root. These are, been, I mean, it's just the et cetera password. It's not a big deal, too big of a deal. But they got it. They got into the server. Um, so that's the basic idea of what an analyst would do when they need to review an incident. Um, so talking about uh, mitigation, actually before I do that I'm going to show you this other one, uh, I'll show you Chaos Reader real quick. Um, oh. So this Chaos Reader is that thing, it's a program, it's a Perl program, it's fantastic. It was written um, a while ago, I don't think it's been updated since 2003 like I said, but it will extract from a PCAP file and um, often will provide images and other great data that will help with uh, figuring out what happened. So, um, let's see. Yeah, while he's getting that set up, Chaos Reader is an excellent program. It extracts all different facets of known program files from a TCP stream. So it will reconstruct pictures, it will reconstruct emails, executables, any number of things that you want to look at. Um, but he's right, it hasn't been updated in a long time and if anybody's aware of any other open source or free utilities that kind of do the same thing, Network Investigator. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? Network Miner. Oh, Network yeah. Miner. And please don't say Net Witness because that's Windows only. <laughs> so I'm going to run this. It goes through it, goes through the PCAP, pulls all that stuff out, and it puts it in the directory I specified. There's all these files. It's not the most user friendly, but you start with index.html. And uh, I don't know what that. Um, 
So it's kind of rough, but it helps in, the, in uh, quickly. You can see what this user was looking at. They're looking at Sarah Palin <laughs> on Amazon. They're going to buy her book. You have to stop them. <laughs> so <laughs> you'll get on that quick. You got to go talk to that user. So and. Uh, this is a great program in terms of like I, I have seen uh, SQL injection attacks and I can run the network traffic on here and it will um, it will provide uh, this is as HTML right here it will actually show you well that'll show you what you see in Wireshark but then typically there's often an, uh, the session there might be another HTML file under there where which will actually show you what the attacker saw the actual web page they were looking at um, it's pretty great so there are a lot of great programs this is just one of them. And uh, go over here to back to this. How do I get back into that? Oh, okay. So mitigation incident response. You want to give a yes uh, again <laughs> user education. I'm going to harp on this again. Your users are your widely most widely deployed IDS. Typically, they're they're best targeted against things like malware and infections. Um, they're not going to help you if your server is getting SQL injected. However, your your server admins. Your programmers, uh, those folks are the ones that you want to talk to and find out why these things are like that. There's a lot of legacy code sitting around. Uh, there's a lot of insecure PHP running around. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been patched or things that have not been updated. Um, these are the things that need to be looked at. They need to be looked at continuously, but nobody really has the resources to do that. So when we start detecting these kind of things, we want to go out and start educating both the users and the admins on the network and get them more focused on security. Security has to be part of everything we do in networking. Um, again, stop using users' administrative access. While that doesn't necessarily always protect them, it does help limit the amount of damage that can be done um, and limits the amount of subversion that can happen on their system, whether it's undermining antivirus or any other number of uh, mechanisms. Proxy servers and firewalls. Um, one of the best things that we have seen recently is using proxies to block sites. I mean, that works great. It really helps protect users from themselves or from those iframe redirects. Uh, depending on if, if you can use gray listing, if you can use white listing, depending on what types of uh, proxies you have in place. Um, a lot of the more common ones now, like blue coat and whatnot, they're actually really just more like modified versions of. Uh, I just drew a blank. Uh, okay. <laughs> Oh well. Uh, squid. Squid. Thank you. Oh. Somebody said it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, they're just modified versions of Squid. Squid is free. You can run it and you can use it to do the exact same things. It works very well. You can either whitelist your internet access if you're in a very tense environment where you have to really restrict what your users are doing, or you can use a form of blacklisting. And there's a number of other mechanisms out there that will tell you what mal like malware URL is a great example, and there are a number of sites out there that will tell you where the bad neighborhoods on the internet are. Uh, de denying certain types of downloads, block posting and on bad IPs. There's a number of things you can do with your mail servers to stop this stuff. There's a bunch of anti-spam software which will stop a lot of phishing attacks. There's a lot of things that you can do, free, low or no cost, uh, to your infrastructure to make things more secure for your users. So uh, I just have a summary basically. It's, uh, I'll just provide some information that uh, what we went over. There's um, the, s the tools are the best one that I found. A lot of people agree is Snort. It's open source. It's fantastic. Uh, if you go to snort.org, you'll see um, uh, they have a download section. They have all those tools I mentioned: pulled pork, barnyard. They have e extra other tools for analysis. They have some great stuff and some great white papers. Um, and uh, you can find some guidelines on setting up your own networks. Uh, I was hoping to provide a step-by-step -step Snort installation guide, but you know there's a million of them out there, and they're, uh, some of them are great and some of them aren't so great. But um, you can. Just do a search and you'll find it. Um, if you have questions, uh, come see us in Capri 112. And here's our emails, too. I don't know if you want to say anything, Chris? No, I'm good. All right. Thank you. We're ending a little early. Thanks a lot.